the word of God proclaimed. at home too. Um, I am, I'm, this morning, I'm thinking about service. And I'm thinking about the, the, the word service in relationship to these poppies. Have you guys got any thoughts about how poppies could mean service? Like how the soldiers um, helped us in the war to keep peace? That's right along the lines that I was thinking. Have you got anything to add to that? You, you're thinking the same thing? How about you guys? Yeah, same thing? Yeah, poppies are a symbol of service. So when people went away to war, or they serve in Canada too, it's an act of choosing something else kind of above yourself, which is what service means. And Jesus was just like that. He did lots of things for people that were around him that were not thinking of himself. And that's the message for us too when we think about service. I was wondering if, if, we, could, if we could stand up and we could see if there's anyone here who might have, come stand up so you can see, if there is someone, anyone in the room who has served our country in the military. And I'm wondering if there's anyone who has family members that serve this country in the military. Lots of hands go up. You guys too. That's awesome. Well, now I'm wondering, of the people who are here, how many of you serve your family, or your community, or your country, or your church? Before you answer that question, let's ask the kids, how do you think that you serve your family, or your church, or your community? To be helpful? Yeah, how else? Come on back. Come stand by me, Kate. To be helpful, Kate. How do you think that you could be helpful to your family? Uh, do you like to vacuum? No. What else do you do to be helpful to your family? Do you do the dishwasher. Um. Do you tidy up? Sometimes. Do you take care of your dog? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you think that you pick up your clothes off your floor? Sometimes. Fold your laundry, maybe? No. No? Help with food? Sometimes. Sometimes. Maybe. Maybe. How about if there's someone at school who is in need of a little bit of help? Do you help them? Yeah. yeah? Uh, there's maybe. You can find an opportunity. I know that you're a kind person, and you'll find opportunities to be kind and be helpful. And at church, I, I want you to look over here and see the musicians. They are serving us to help us sing and help us worship. And there's people downstairs who literally serve us cookies. <laughs> <laughs> and 
and they serve us. There's lots of people who serve at church in all sorts of ways. People who look after our money and people who teach us. Remember, you're coming to stand beside me. Come on, stand by me. So thank you. Can we look out here and can we see people, just by raising your hands, who serve your family or your community or your church? Yeah, that's a lot of people who help in our community and who help help each other. And they are doing just what Jesus said, to love others and to love him. So we are going to help serve our community in a little bit by helping to read the song. So first we have someone who's coming to read for us and then we are going to serve. A reading from the Wisdom of Solomon. But the souls of the righteous are in the hand of God, and no torment will ever touch them. In the eyes of the foolish they seem to have died, and their departure was thought to be a disaster. And they're going from us to be their destruction. But they are at peace. For though in the sight of others they were punished, their hope is full of immortality. Having been disciplined a little, they will receive a great good, because God tested them and found them worthy of himself. Like gold in the furnace, he tried them. And like a sacrificial burnt offering, he accepted them. In the time of their visitation, they will shine forth and will run like sparks through the stubble. They will govern nations and rule over peoples, and the Lord will reign over them forever. Those who trust in him will understand truth, and the faithful will abide with him in love, because grace and mercy are upon his holy ones, and he watches over his elect. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church today. With your help, O Lord, we will listen and live. So guys, we're going to pray the song together. We're going to help people to pray the song. You know why praying the songs is important? What do you guys think? Yeah, that's right. But there's people praying this song that we're going to say all over the world. Some will be on battlefields, being led by chaplains. Others will be in hospitals led by chaplains at hospitals, and millions of people will be in churches, just like this, all over the world, praying the words we're going to pray together now. So we're uniting with them and calling out to God for help and strength. So let's do it. So we're going to say the first part where it says celebrant and children, and everyone else is going to join in. You guys want to do it? Together. I love, I love the Lord, who has heard the voice of my supplication, who has listened to me, whenever I called. The cords of death entangled me, the grip of the grave took hold of me. Then I called upon the name of the Lord, Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. The Lord watches over the innocent. Turn again to your rest, O my soul. For you, O Lord, have rescued my life from death. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Thank you so much for your help, and may your time with Shannon be great.
Our, um, our gradual song is Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven. Please stand. <laughs> Praise my soul, the King of heaven, and his feet by drinking of rain, ransom he restored for me, and evermore his praises sing. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, all of them became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a shout, Look, here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those bridesmaids got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, no, there will not be enough for you and for us. You had better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they went to buy it, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the other bridesmaids came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, truly I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. The Gospel of Christ. <laughs> Please be seated. 
it. If there is a way to turn me down just a little bit, if not, that's all good. Well, good to see you again. Weddings are a time of heightened emotion, as one would expect. A time when we celebrate one of the most important transitional moments in human life, in any society. And uh, for those of you that are wondering if evening weddings are normal, in most parts of the world, they are. In fact, my parents tell me about their wedding, which was on a Friday night, because, of course, uh, up until the last few decades, most people worked on the day of their wedding and, you know, couldn't afford just to take the whole day off. So what we read about in the story, uh, needing lamps for a wedding, is indeed the norm. It's not surprising, then, that people sometimes do weird things at weddings. Um, it's not surprising that normally confident men are sweating through their tuxes as they pace the vestibule floor before the service. And if the bride isn't on time, if the wedding party isn't on time, the sweating doubles. I've seen that happen. Or when they finally get to that point in the service where they look at each other to say the vows, the, the husband, the wife, or the two people that are getting married, um, one of them will burst into tears, even though at the, at, the ceremony, at the ceremony rehearsal the night before, it had all been laughs and giggles and no big deal. Weddings do that to people. They're, they're, they're a time of great excitement. And they're also a time of great disappointment. Uh, the catering company doesn't come through, does something completely unplanned for or untoward, does something completely unplanned for or untoward, or that person that you really hoped would join you for the celebration is coming from across the pond. Well, she missed her connection is languishing in some airport lobby instead of toasting you. So, we can kind of relate viscerally to talk of a wedding, to this parable, the parable of the ten bridesmaids. Both relatable, and yet it has elements, as in the case of many of Jesus' greatest parables, that are strangely off-putting. For those of you familiar with the Hebrew Proverbs, you'll resonate with the imagery of five wise maidens and five foolish ones. The contrast draws to mind the, the, the figure of Lady Wisdom, Sophia in Greek, and Lady Folly, Moria in Greek, in case you're wondering why Moria never became a popular girl's name. <laughs> Jesus' life and teaching as a whole and certainly the extension of his life and teaching by the Spirit through time is nothing less than the unveiling of God's radical wisdom, a wisdom that other versions of wisdom think of as folly. Jesus, or Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians 2 when he talks about God's foolishness being greater than the world's wisdom. This whole section of Matthew has Jesus at his most epic. He's here truly the new Moses, daring even in the next section to lay out a plan of wisdom for all the nations, that if followed would mean an end to all want, a need, an end to all, all food crises, if you will, an end to war. But that's a sermon for another time, even though this is... Remembrance Sunday. We are, in fact, using the proper uh, gospel for the, for the Sunday, not for the uh, Remembrance Day celebration or remembrance. Of course, you know what I'm trying to say as I stumble my way through it. This parable, in the midst of this larger vision, is so important because by saying that the kingdom of God is like the preparation for a wedding, Jesus orients us 
to a fundamentally positive vision for our lives and for the world. We're, we're quite used to warnings, even warnings from Jesus. Indeed, there's a dire warning in this parable. And we're used to our parents, our teachers, and our preachers telling us to be on the lookout for temptation, for that evil that is all too ready to pounce. We're not used to a teacher or a parent pulling us out of the room and saying, as we quiver and quake, waiting for the bad news, get ready to partay. We're not used to that. Given Jesus' reputation as one who's always drawing the marginalized into God's feast, the kingdom of God, we're, we're waiting for, for some of that, for sure, but we're just not sure how this parable is going to fulfill that, or maybe Jesus' teaching as a whole. By way of analogy, I was thinking about uh, February 2022 when we sat down with Denise's surgeon two weeks after her, her life-changing back surgery in Germany, which I've talked about in other sermons. And I was expecting all kinds of warnings about what she would have to not do or look out for the rest of her life. Of course, he um, talked about rehab, he talked about prescribed physio and the like, but he didn't give any warnings. He looked at her and said, now you need to live your life. Do what you've always wanted to do. Go for it. That's why we did this. Don't hold back. This, this parable is about that sort of preparedness. On either side are parables that emphasize watchfulness and, and using our gifts and talents wisely. But this parable of the wedding helps us not get tied in knots, if you'll excuse the pun, in a kind of fight or flight mentality. It, it explains what is really kind of a weird feature of this parable, that when the bridegroom doesn't show up, the bridesmaids, all ten of them, the wise and the foolish ones, take a nap, chill out. It's the clue that we need to understand that having enough oil in your lamp is not about a kind of brute, pry your eyelids open, keep on guard against the bad stuff that might happen. It's not that kind of watchfulness. It's the clue we need to know that Jesus isn't urging us to maintain a kind of cortisol response. I mean, there may be some people here in the room that have to do that for work. If you're, if you're a brain surgeon, I listened to an interview once with a brain surgeon, and his wife was a brain surgeon too. They were living in Boston, and somebody uh, filled them in two months after 9-11 happened, that 9-11 happened. They hadn't known. They were just constantly on the moment's notice waiting for the next surgery. Maybe you're a soldier on the front line. Maybe you're somebody who lives in an abusive household. And because of that, you're always having to keep alert. Having enough oil in your lamp is not that kind of readiness. It's more about a readiness to participate with passion in Jesus' positive vision of life with God. People have misconstrued the bridegroom's coming at midnight to be some sort of end-time theology in which the Messiah comes back and some of us can miss it because, hey, we have to go down to the corner store to get some supplies. But when Jesus says, the kingdom, then the kingdom will be like this, he's not saying at the end, but in the light of what's going to be happening, in the light of his death and resurrection, in the light of the fact that Christ's death and resurrection reveals the wedding-like nature of God's reality, we're urged to allow this reality to appear. That's the Greek word for epiphany or to come close, that's Advent in Latin, to emerge in our lives, 
to live into the fact that God, the Messiah, the bridegroom, wants each of you, wants each of us to know the joy of participation. Keep awake, therefore, which comes right at the end of the parable, isn't a return to vigilance, since we know about the nap earlier. It's not that kind of watchfulness. It's, it's like the songs say, let your light shine. Take part in the feast. It's about participation, about getting into it. Weirdly, that might be a way to relate wedding readiness to honoring those who fought to protect our freedoms. They were ready to live, and so they were ready to die. Well, what on this reading of this parable would it mean to not have oil in your lamp? Well, I thought about Denise coming home from life-changing surgery with the surgeons, now go live your best life, ringing in her ears, but instead of going for it, like she did, doing the rehab, looking for full-time work after years of being unable to work because of the painkillers, deciding, you know what? Nah, I'm too scared to do any of that. I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna do anything, I'm just gonna sit in my house. Not getting oil for your lamp might mean indulging in fantasies, going down rabbit holes of conspiracy theories, playing videos, video games, or golfing every day, or going to the casino, or anything really that can then act not as a momentary escape, which all of those things could be, and be done so fairly innocently, but as patterns in which we avoid life. We avoid life for fear of mattering. And that's what it is. It's folly, because it's cowardly. It's the wastefulness of a lack of purpose when the purpose of each of our lives is to live. And as we live, to give each other a helping hand. I think this helps us to make sense of the disturbing line right at the end, truly I tell you I don't know you. The longer we go, if we are, without living into God's beauty, truth, and goodness, the harder it is to engage in the feast, the feast for which each of us were made, the harder it is to recognize it when it emerges around you or bubbles up inside of you. I was listening to Matthew Perry, the actor from Friends who recently passed away. In his memoir, he had this brilliant quote, I think you have to have all your dreams come true to realize they are the wrong dreams. How many of us have just allowed that to become a reality? <clears throat> or to paraphrase C.S. Lewis, God offers us a holiday by the sea, but often we rather choose the mud puddle in the back alley. The wedding feast is on offer. Live your best life with God, in God, with all God's resources. You matter that much. Amen. If you're able, please join me in affirming our faith. We believe and trust in God, the Creator, source of all being and life, the one for whom we exist. We believe and trust in God, the Word, 
who took our human nature, died for us, and rose again. We believe and trust in God the Holy Spirit, who gives life to the people of God and makes Christ known in the world. This is the faith we affirm. We believe and trust in one God, the holy and undivided Trinity. I invite you to take a position of prayer, standing, sitting, or kneeling, that is suitable for you. Thomas Merton. Almighty and merciful God, Father of all, creator and ruler of the universe, Lord of history, whose designs are inscrutable, whose glory is without blemish, whose compassion for the errors of men is inexhaustible, in your will is our peace. Help us to be masters of the weapons that threaten to master us. Help us to use our science for peace and plenty, not for war and destruction. Show us how to use military power to bless our children's children, not to blight them. Grant us to seek peace where it is truly found. In your will, O oh God, is our peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the world. Creator God, you have created our world with unfathomable grace and intricate beauty. As the days shorten toward winter solstice, we ask that you might bring light into our souls, that we might be warmed by your quiet voice of wisdom, the indwelling Holy Spirit, in the dormant winter days to come. God of peace, we are overwhelmed by the devastation of warfare. We weep for the innocent, caught in the crossfire of rage and power. Pray comfort the weak, the powerless, the bereaved. Bring your hope where there is none visible. May the wisdom of your Holy Spirit work to soften the positions of leaders who instruct these wars. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our country, thankful for the freedom we enjoy. Give wisdom to our leaders at every level of government. Soften their political motives and strengthen their desire for higher good for all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the church. We give you thanks for the wisdom, grace, and dignity with which Justin Welby carries his responsibility as the Archbishop of Canterbury. We are grateful for the gentle and wise leadership of Linda Nicol, Primate of the Anglican Church of Canada, and for members of the Council of General Synod. For our Bishop Anna and the diocesan staff, for our Rector, Father Allen, and the leadership of St. Philip, we give you thanks. We are blessed indeed. Pray be our guide as we move forward in our desire to be a meaningful presence in this city. In our diocesan cycle of prayer, we pray for the people of St. Saviour by the Sea, Cortez Island, and Reverend Stephanie Wood. In our provincial cycle, we pray for the people and clergy of the Diocese of Kootenay and Archbishop Lynn McNaughton. In the American Council of Indigenous People, we pray for their Archbishop Chris Harper and for the souls of the children who died at the residential schools. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our Remembrance Day. O oh God of peace, today we honor and remember those who have served this country in military service. And we are grateful for the wisdom of Solomon, which assures us that the souls of the righteous are in the hand of God, and no torment will ever touch them. They are at peace. Thanks be to God. We also honor those who today continue to serve during times of warfare, 
conflict, and peace. Give them courage and strength for their work. Draw out their highest good in the service they have chosen. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we are all members of the same body, and if one member suffers, all suffer. In this spirit of connectedness, we hold in our hearts the special needs of Yoga Berjink, Robert Holloway, Ricardo Cravel, Marcus's mum, Karen Norman, Helen Skodas, Becky Tuffin and their family as they await the arrival of their first grandchild, Molly Wentong, the congregation of Mar Elias Church in Rabla, Syria, and their priest, Father Bassam Neem, the Hazara people of Afghanistan. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Again from Merton. O oh God, in accepting one another wholeheartedly, fully, completely, we accept you, and we thank you, and we adore you, and we love you with our whole being, because our being is in your being. Our spirit is rooted in your spirit. Fill us then with love, and let us be bound together with love as we go our diverse ways united in this one spirit which makes you present in the world and which makes you witness to the ultimate reality that is love. Love has overcome. Love is victorious. Amen. We continue our prayers with a confession and absolution. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. As you're able, please stand with me. Brothers and sisters, may the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Let us exchange this peace. Offertory is be still my soul.
Gracious and righteous Lord, we are united in the love of Jesus Christ. Accept all we offer you this day, and bring us with all your faithful people who have gone before us into his eternal glory, who is Lord, now and forever. Blessed are you, gracious God, creator of heaven and earth. We give you thanks and praise through Jesus Christ, our Lord, whose victorious rising from the dead has given to us the hope of resurrection and the promise of eternal life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and all who have served you in every age, we raise our voices to proclaim the glory of your name. and above all in the Word made flesh, Jesus your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, the death he freely accepted, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, Father, according to his command, 
Dying, you destroyed our death. Rising, you restored our life. Lord Jesus, come in glory. We offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving.